Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Level Up podcast. I'm your host, Ken Rose, co-founder and CTO at OpsLevel. OpsLevel is an internal developer portal that helps engineering teams quickly ship quality software. Our Level Up podcast explores challenges, best practices, and stories from some of the brightest engineering and DevOps leaders about what it takes to build great products, teams, and companies. Today, I'm honored to welcome James Turnbull to our podcast. James is a prolific engineering leader, previously serving as SVP of engineering at Sotheby's, VP of engineering at Timber, which was acquired by Datadog, and countless leadership roles at companies like Microsoft, Kickstarter, Docker, Venmo, and Puppet. James has chaired the O'Reilly's uh, Velocity Conference. He advises a number of startups. He is also the author of numerous technical books, including the Docker book, the Terraform book, and the Art of Monitoring. Uh, and James recently started a new role as VP of Product Engineering at Smarter, which is a subscription management platform for direct-to-consumer brands on Shopify. James, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I was wondering maybe, you know, I, I've given you a little bit, a bit of an intro here and you have a kind of a prolific history, but I was wondering if you could just tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself. Sure. So I'm, I'm originally from Australia, um, uh, but I've been living in the US for the last sort of almost 15 years. Uh, I've been an engineer for about 25 years, which makes me feel super old all of the time. Um, and uh, one, I have a bunch of engineers who are, who I'm, I think I'm old enough to be their parent, which is always a bit weird. Um, but uh, my, large, my focus has largely been on um, high growth startups and, and uh, building engineering teams in high growth startups, dealing with uh, you know, scaling um, sort of hyper growth. Um, and uh, sort of adjacent to that, um, I was fairly heavily involved in sort of early DevOps and SRE sort of work around um, companies like Puppet and uh, and Docker, uh, really heavily involved in the early sort of DevOps days, and and um, and then later on to, to focused on observability, and now more recently, pretty heavily focused on sort of the platform engineering space and thinking about how to uh, re envisage um, technology as platforms um, and re envisage, uh, you know, the I guess moving the abstraction layer up from infrastructure into sort of the SRE, and now I think into what is probably a, a, a platform evolution. Awesome. I'd love to ask you to, to kind of pull on that thread a little bit, right? When you were at Sotheby's, you spun up a platform engineering team there. I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about what were some of the problems that they were facing and when do you think organizations kind of hit that mark of being able to say, hey, we, we kind of need a platform team now? Yeah, so um, Sotheby's had a, a, what was effectively a DevOps SRE function. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, for all intents and purposes, the platform team. They just didn't call themselves that and didn't sort of recognize that as a discipline. Um, uh, I think that, that the problems that, that, that Sotheby's were seeing were not so much... Um, it was less problems and more acknowledgement of what that team did, which was basically they supported the underpinnings of the whole, um, you know, the whole customer-facing infrastructure. Uh, you know, they're responsible for things like Kubernetes... Um, responsible for for um, building the sort of infrastructure around Terraform and deployments, and uh, responsible for CI/CD. Um, and uh, really, what my role was 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 sort of branding it as the right thing, and then ensuring that the sort of OKRs, KPIs were focused around um, essentially providing uh, reducing the level of friction uh, in in the overall organization, focused on developer happiness, developer productivity. Um, and ensuring that as much as possible, we had a self-service platform that allowed developers to focus on building product um, and removed the sort of friction in that uh, in there having to interact with infrastructure or, or having to interact with tooling um, and, and a real focus on sort of uh, allowing people to be, you know, the, the, the fast, that short, shortening the cycle time between people writing code and having that code in the hands of customers and making the company money. That's amazing. Can you talk a little bit about, you mentioned like reducing friction. What were some of the friction points that product developers were experiencing? Um, I think some of it, local development was tricky. Like it's a fairly complex app. Um, local development was, was, was problematic. Um, uh, definitely some, some things like CICD were, were quite long running um, and a little bit hard to maintain. Um, it was definitely some, there were some observability challenges. Um, but I think most principally it was, there wasn't a, a you know, I guess if you step step back, there wasn't a holistic view of like this is a life cycle. This is an um, you know in the battle days we'd call an SDLC. Um, uh, I don't like the term. I think it's sort of a bit um, reductive. But uh, thinking about it in terms of like our mission as an engineering uh, or in this case a product engineering organization 
um, is to is to ship product that makes the cu- our customers happy and makes our stakeholders and the business money. Um, and that means that we need to think about like how do things get into that pipeline? How are they how are they designed and thought about? How are they built? How are they shipped? Um, how are they monitored? And and closing that loop, um, how are they iterated and improved on? Um, and so a, a lot of my work at Southern Business was really around um, pivoting the whole engineering organization towards that mentality. That's awesome. And platform engineering then sounds like kind of the, this lubricant to be able to like allow all the other product teams to flow mo- more easily through uh, what you previously called the SDLC. Yeah, um, I look at platform engineering. Um, so my ideal world is that is that um, if I'm uh, if I'm an engineer building a new service, then um, I have uh, a concept of, of you know what that service that, that that service runs on top of a thing, a platform that I, I can consume. Um, I have templates for uh, observability, um, for templates for security, templates for um, uh, you know authentication, access control, authorization. Um, so all of those things are things that I can I can uh, um, essentially say. You know, create new service, and then I get the scaffolding, all the pieces I need, and I can focus on the business logic. I don't have to worry about like, um, you know, am I logging the right things? Do I have to? I don't have to worry about like, have I connected the right metrics? Um, I have a step by step set of instructions that says, I need to, to put this instrumentation here. Uh, I need to tune this here. But the vast majority of the work um, uh, is more about understanding how the business logic works and how the how the things will flow through the service than it is about having to build the, the, the plumbing, the plumbing. Guess, of the service. Yeah. yeah. sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is, is that golden path, right? It's like let uh, product developers worry about the business logic and the pieces that are core for them and have everything else kind of be automated and presented for them. Yeah. Um, and I think that for a lot of engineers, um, it's not their of expertise. And I, this is a classic. Um, I have a conversation with people fairly frequently about um, uh, they've rolled their own authentication in some way or they've created, they've, they've, uh, They've looked at, they've built something that is not core business to them. Um, maybe it's an observability thing, maybe it's a logging thing, maybe it's an authentication thing or a compute thing of some kind. And and they're like, they're really proud of the thing they built. And I'm like, okay, so you know, what, what what value is this delivering that wouldn't be available to you on the market? Like if you went out to, to make a build versus buy decision, like you've built a really cool bit of technology, um, what, what value does it add to the organization? Uh, and what resources does it consume um, while you're constructing it? Um, and how much does that take away from the, the core mission of the engineering team, which is to build functionality for our customers um, and to make the business money? And so the platform team is a way to be able to sort of a forcing factor on some of those build-by decisions to say, this is a, uh, well, it's our black box and it's the wrong term, but this is a, um, uh, this is a, uh, an underlying service, an underlying platform um, about for which you are a, a customer of and we treat you like a customer and you have service levels and reporting all that sort of stuff rather than uh, you know something you have to hack together in order to, 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 to be able to do your job. Yeah, again, it, it also sounds like it becomes a point of leverage, right? Like if you have one team that built this really cool, I'll pick on authentication, that's great for that one team, but how do you get that piece then reused across the organization? Like how do you get some consistency yeah, you know, and across your services. Additionally, things like security, I'm, I'm like, obviously, security companies have had issues over the years with regards to vulnerabilities um, and some outages. Some some fairly big name sort of authentication providers have had some pretty substantial outages over the last few years. But I'm more confident of, a, of a, an authentication company with 10,000 customers um, than I am of the um, authentication platform that my very, very smart engineers, but my engineers in a very small um uh, community have built like I just I just feel like that's a not a good use of, of time and money for the business uh, with not, with limited sort of value add that we can't get from from a from a, a bought service, but also it presents a business risk that I don't necessarily need to have. That makes sense. You know, as I think about uh, platform engineering, I think of it as a very broad discipline, right? Like you touched on, it touches CI, CD, it touches observability, uh, tooling, developer experience, infrastructure. What are, if you're spinning up a new platform team, what are the areas that platform teams should think about focusing on first? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, uh, to sort of go back in time, like a lot of, um, if you look at the evolution of like, let's say DevOps, for example, um, a lot of DevOps happened um, 
uh, you know, DevOps was really about changing the way we built software rather than, um, and that meant some cultural and process change as well as some technology and tooling. Naturally, tooling, um, uh, being engineers to, and, and marketing people as well, tooling sort of became the sort of the center of that conversation. Um, so a lot of things people that were previously like operations team were just rebranded as DevOps teams and then later on rebranded as SRE teams. I have opinions on that, by the way, yeah. that, you know, our, that that wasn't a good exercise in this. No, do. no, I don't think it was either. Um, like, I think there's a there's a spectrum here. There's definitely some folks on the DevOps side who are very focused on the culture of things, end of things, which I think at the expense of like understanding how we like it's it's a compromise. Like, you still need the tooling, you still need the culture change. It, one extreme or the other is bad. It's a balance of shipping things. Um, so, platform teams. Are, my worry is that somebody takes their DevOps SRE team and just rebrands it, um, and I think that's uh, uh, that's where that's you know a, 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 what I would describe as a trap for young players. Um, I, when I think about a platform team, I think about it's really looking across at your organization and saying, what are the functions that underpin um, that, that, that life cycle of us shipping product? Um, and particularly with regards to the sort of the, the engineering portion of, the, of, the, of that life cycle, um, what, are, what, are, what does a developer need in order to, to get started, onboard, write software, um, test software, QA software, put software into into production, monitor software, detect issues, et cetera, et cetera. And I would pull those pieces out of the business. A lot of those pieces are SRE centric sort of things, um, but they're also like API management. Like um, what you know, where, where if you're thinking about a holistic service, then your API or your authentication or those things are holistic services that that are shared across multiple teams. Um, you know the the ownership of the API, its performance, um, uh, the concepts around sort of change management and and um, uh, development of that API would be things that I would um, I would say probably pull, would be worth considering pulling into a platform team. Uh, there's a lot of back end services, um, you know that that are that are uh, I guess anything you would define as shared, like where where there's a cross functional responsibility for something. Um, particularly in the back-end sort of space, I would say that's worth an evaluation of something to pull into a platform team. So I think good platform teams are probably made up of uh, folks who have sort of an SRE sort of specialization as well as sort of back engineers with, with perhaps a, um, you know, maybe distributed systems or, a, um, you know, sort of, sort of view of the world. Uh, event processing systems, for example, another example of something that's a shared service that I think was probably belongs in a platform. Um, you know, service scaffolding, um, uh, service level objectives, like the scaffolding and things like that, also something that belongs in that sort of organization. So that's what I say to people is look around your organization, work out who those people, it's pretty easy to see in most organizations who are the key people. It is super simple to look at a, an organization's um, repository and work out who are the people that actually represent the underpinnings of, and the people everyone asks the question of, like if they, ha- like there's an API change, so everyone goes, Oh, we all go and talk to Linda because Linda built this thing and she understands it perfectly and she's the one that we all go and have a conversation with. Um, I shouldn't pick on Linda, but um, the, 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 the essentially the, that, that sort of, those are the people you think about, okay, maybe if I consolidated these, these, consolidated these people and presented it in such a way that this is like, we're now turning this into a service we provide, not just ad hoc conversations um, about change, then that's how our platform team sort of becomes a, a reality. There's kind of this mantra I've heard of, you know, treat your platform like a product, right? That, yeah. that, that yep. platform developers are, are working with product developers as the consumer. It sounds like that, that there's an analog there with what you're saying. Yeah. About as a um, service. And it's interesting. It's one of the discussions that I had at Sotheby's, um, a couple of staff engineers there, super smart people, Chad and Patrick, and we were talking about like, what does product management look like for platform? Like, should there be a, a, a platform product manager? And the challenge we sort of encountered is that there are definitely product managers who are very technical people um, who are former engineers. There's a very common path. You know, ex-engineer becomes a product manager. Um, uh, Google's sort of TPM model, you know, technical program managers, um, technical product managers, uh, definitely are po- folks who are deeply experienced te- technology people. Um, but, you know, it, it, is, it is definitely a, a lift to find a product management person who would be the best sort of fit for that. Um, so we we never quite reached a resolution before I before I left, but I think the uh, it ends up being that those staff engineers, principal engineers, the folks at the senior senior levels of those platform teams, are very much product centric people. Um, they, they think about things in a product way. They 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 build processes in a product centric way, um, and I think that mentality, as you said, is is a, is key to 
uh, understanding that, you know, I, I, I probably glossed over a little bit earlier when I talked about like it's a service to the business. I mean, any service to the business is effectively a product um, and it should be like requirements should be gathered, feedback should be gotten, um, priority should be made uh, in the same way you would do with a customer facing service, the external customer facing service. I want to kind of touch on that. Like um, you, we talked a little bit about like product management as a process. What are some other kind of like tools or processes that you think are important to, to have an effective platform team? Um, I mean, I, 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 to me, the, the inputs and outputs of any sort of product, like the, um, uh, you're talking to your customers and asking them about their experiences. Um, you're keeping, um, you know, w whether that be an automated, um, quantitative kind of way, like metrics and, um, service level objectives, um, uh, you know, uh, throughput, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you're also asking them about their experiences in a, uh, in a qualitative kind of way. We, we, at Sotheby's, we ran surveys, for example, to ask about, you know, what's the developer experience like? What's frictionful for you? Because sometimes you can't see that, right? The, the, everything looks great, but it um, turns out that everyone is having the same problem and, you know, everyone has the same hacky workaround to make the local development environment do something X, whatever it happens to be. But you don't know because it's not reflected in the metrics. It may just be a blip on the, on the time it takes to, you know, open a PR, but you don't, you don't see that necessarily. So asking those questions um, and then um, taking those in as much as a, a product manager would, um, putting those in the backlog, prioritizing them, um, determining what has the most you know, um, uh, business benefit or impact and, and what is the cost. Um, and then more importantly, telling your customers how you're doing and what's happening and what's going on in the platform. Um, uh, I think we often get the, um, the, you know, it's pretty common in a sort of SRE sort of world to get the, um, uh, the first part right. Like a, a classic mistake in an observability project is to spend three quarters of the project working how to collect the data and the last um, quarter of the project working how to present it to people. Um, it turns out that, that communicating this sort of information is really hard and, and visualization is a really difficult problem. Um, which is why designers always laugh themselves, uh, laugh at, at, at engineers when engineers like, here's that dashboard, and designers are like, oh no, like this is not, this is not a great representation of, of how the world should look. And um, uh, so I, I think that that you need to have that that feedback cycle as well of like, hey, in the typical product way of like, we built the thing you wanted. Um, here's here's how you measure that we were successful. But also in like, this is the state of the platform. This is the health of things. Like this is. This is, um, you know, uh, here, here are some metrics that help you understand how things are performing, um, not only from a, a, you know, a level of comfort that that's, the, the platform is functioning, but also to help people be able to make decisions about, like, if I do this, what's, what, you know, what, what are the implications of, of that change on my environment? Got it. So really, like, uh, do things and tell people, but, like, having a big focus on the, like, telling people and showing them and yep. making it clear for everybody, this is how we're evaluating performance, this is, you know, how you should be buying into this as a stakeholder. Yeah, the other thing, too, is I often find that, um, you know, we focus very heavily on onboarding and, and, like, getting people up to speed and become productive, which is obviously key in, in, in sort of bringing a new engineer on board. But continuing ed education is a really hit and miss thing in a lot of engineering organisations. I have definitely worked in places where substantial change has been made by sort of platform-centric folks and you discover that pockets of the organization are still using the old process or they haven't migrated or they haven't taken advantage of something, sometimes just because they didn't know about it, uh, other times because they didn't understand like the implications. You can't, um, you don't necessarily want to do the work for people, but you want to you know, have a follow the bouncing ball um, you know, guide to like, this is how you, you, you fit into the new logging world. Or, like you've got, to get, you've got to be able to bring people along on the journey. And if you're not have, doing that outbound marketing, that outbound communication, um, you know, you can build these really cool things. If no one uses them, how cool are they? You know, that, and that's almost the the tower of product management, right? There, when you're building a platform, there's this internally as program management function, like you built yep. it, but now you have to, uh, yeah, talk to teams about it, convince teams, do marketing basically, and get people to buy in, and you know, schedule the work to migrate their systems to like this new platform. Uh, and there's coordination that's involved in that. And I agree, like a lot of times, I can just be, oh yeah, we'll do that. Like we're focused on building and not on the like implementation or the rollout. Yeah, and um, I, I try not to use the word marketing because it tends to make engineers cringe a little bit, but um, it is really, it, it's like you build a cool thing, you need to sell this cool thing to, to your colleagues as to why they should use it. Hopefully you've, you've gone out and talked to them all and gathered their requirements and you're building something they actually want. Sometimes you know, a classic mantra of product management is also like sometimes the customer um, uh, 
doesn't actually ask for the best possible thing or doesn't ask for the right thing or doesn't really understand what they're asking for. Um, but that's no reason to treat the customer with any disrespect. And the same applies to engineers who are equally sort of, you know, they're talented, smart, technical people um, you know, that they can understand compromises and understand what you do. So, you know, you, you really need to go, you know, we asked you, you identify these problems, we prioritise them. This is how we solved it. Um, you know, give it a try. Let's give us some feedback. Let, let's iterate on, on a solution that makes you happy. Um, again, very classic product management techniques uh, applied to what was previously more technical realm. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up like the, the cringiness of marketing and engineers because before starting Ops Level, I also was an engineer. I wrote code. I still consider myself an engineer. But I also was like, you know, I, I had a very negative view of anything marketing. It's like, oh, the yep. marketing team is shoving propaganda down. But now I, I see both sides. I'm also a startup founder and we make a developer product and we have marketing that we do. And unless you tell people, hey, this is the thing we're building and here's the value it can provide for you how are they going to know, right? And so that is, yeah. you know, whether marketing is a, a bad word or not, it's more like, it's just the essence of like, I built this thing and it's hopefully solving a problem you have. And here's here's the problem, here's how you can self-select and here's the solution we offer. Yeah, this, this is a really interesting area. I, I was a developer advocate for, for uh, several times in my career. Um, and I found the best developer advocacy programs were the ones that weren't run out of sales and marketing. They were the ones that run out of engineering um, or product even. Um, uh, or sometimes community, things like that. Where, but, but essentially they came out of technical underpinnings, particularly if you're selling a technology product, as you as you all know, to engineers. If they get an email from me that feels like marketing, um, they'll bin it, right? Or they feel like they're being sold to. Um, if they actually get any, have an experience, and um, you know, Kelsey Hightower is probably the absolute master of this particular process, right? He's a genius at, at, at finding that point of leverage um, where he says, you know, this is, this is my, I'm here to make your life easier. I'm here to make your life better. I'm here to allow you to focus on the cool stuff in your job and not have to worry about this other stuff um, because we built a cool thing that does it for you. Um, engineers absolutely love, you know, we're, we're fairly inherently lazy people when it comes to a lot of things. Once we automate things all the time, uh, Larry Wall used to talk about, you know, like, you know, the, the, the traits of the, the most, the, the trade of the best, the best trade of engineers is their, is their, their hatred of, of, of waste and, and their right. desire to, the mundane, the yeah, mundane exactly. their desire to automate that away to be able to focus on the cool stuff. Um, and if you sell people that, that, that's still marketing, but it's, it's, it's done in such a way that it's not, you know, people, people are like, I, I want to buy into this. And, and those people become your best, best customers because they're, they're, they, they amplify your signal because they're like, I talk to these people, they built this thing, it's really cool, I love it. And they have credibility that, that your marketing team would kill to have. Um, and I, I just, I just, I look at people and they always have a conversation with them like, if you're going to build a developer advocacy program, it needs to be technology centric. It needs to have credibility and not be perceived as a sales function. 100%. Even if it is a sales function. <laughs> Because you're right, developers know if they're kind of being sold to yeah. and they want to, you need to, somebody who has empathy with what developers are going through, exactly. right? Uh, yeah. yeah. We talked a little bit here, here, James, around developer experience and onboarding. I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that. Like what is, what is effective developer experience or really good onboarding look like for you? I used to be of the, um, I used to have a very super, uh, facile perhaps, um, uh, like view of this. I was like, uh, developer opportunities and is an is a, a developer onboarding is an opportunity to identify the the friction in our process and every new developer maybe updates the onboarding script a little bit or writes a bit of documentation or updates the the script that, that installs the local development environment and and we get iteratively better and now I'm like wow that was really mean of me because I'm in, I'm dropping some poor brand new person who doesn't know anything about an environment and saying fend fish for yourself like fend for yourself and if you find a problem fix it and make it better for the next person I'm like that's a really crappy way to treat a new a new member of the team um, and now so I think about it in terms of the best possible onboarding experience is where everything is turnkey right like you arrive you get you uh, or you know you you start. Uh, you have a laptop. You have a, have um, you know you have a device. You have everything you need on that device. You have access to all the services you need. There's a really simple roadmap that says these are all the things that are in our world. Um, there's a series of, of concentrated set of sessions that take you through, like uh, the same way that HR would do, like these are your benefits. It's it's like this is how we this is how the product is architected. This is the workflow that you go through when you create a, a pull request. And, and I'm a big fan of like as fast as possible getting someone to open their first, per, first pull request. And the classic one in startups is like, add yourself to the team page or, you know, um, uh, do something, pick up a small bug or, or you know, make a copy change, anything like that where you are, you know, experience that up front. 
Um, and then someone take you through these are the tools we have. Um, these are the these are the places you got to look for things. These are the dashboards. These are the these are the your teams. Um, you know, repositories of knowledge. Um, these are the tools we use to communicate. These are the tools we use to manage um, our products and our life cycle. Um, I think those things, um, like providing that experience where it is turnkey, it's like there's maybe there's always going to be questions, but the, 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 the person is able to go, I, I feel like I have a, a roadmap, a landscape for what I, what I need. Um, if I can't find the answer here, I know who to go and ask and, and I'm not fending for myself. I'm not dipping left until I... Uh, hopefully, you know, like uh, you know, um, uh, fed, 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 uh, fed, slice the pizza under the door until I become productive and start shipping code. I'm actually part of the team from day one. Huge fan of um, mentoring, pairing. Um, uh, I think that uh, shadowing is enormously powerful, particularly for junior engineers. Is is uh, uh, you know, um, if you're a junior engineer, perhaps you're not ready to be pairing with somebody more senior. Like it's 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 a pretty scary experience. But shadowing somebody for a, for a couple of weeks, where you know you um. You are, uh, do, you know, watching what they're doing, how, how they're doing things. Um, you know, you're doing a little bit of pairing on some basic stuff for that person. That's a really powerful way to get people up to speed, and also a really powerful way for junior engineers to feel empowered. Um, I have strong opinions about onboarding that I, I didn't used to, um, and uh, I, I just say to people, you know, you've spent an enormous amount of money acquiring this talent, um, both in terms of their salary. Um, the recruitment costs, the the time and, and materials you've spent, like investing in interviewing and and recruitment process and all that sort of stuff. Why would you not want them to be as productive and happy as possible from day one? Why would you not? Want, why would you want them to have a bumpy landing on, on their first right. day? It's 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 it doesn't make good business sense. Yep, absolutely. And it sounds like again the overarching thrust really is again back to that point of removing friction. By providing context, by you know, uh, providing access to mentorship, access to documentation, uh, access to you know a list of everything of running in production. But here's all the context you need to be effective as an engineer in our in our new company. Yep, exactly. Awesome. As you think back to, and maybe this is at Sotheby's or, or other organizations where you spun up a platform team, is there anything you kind of wish you'd done differently, or anything where you know <laughs> it didn't go as well as you were kind of initially hoping? Um. I don't know that I, uh, you know, I think some of these things went pretty smoothly. Um, uh, I think that the the key thing here is, is is finding the right talent. You need to find the right people to be, um, you do need to have those product-centric engineers. You need to have those folks who think about things in that product-centric way. Um, there are definitely some incredibly smart ICs who, who build amazing technology, um, but some of them are not, um, uh, perhaps not the best people to, 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 to sell that technology to people or to, uh, or to do that gather requirements gathering sort of exercise. Um, and so you, the composition of that platform team, I've definitely sort of put people on, these are the smartest people in the organization about this particular topic. Um, and there is a strong habit in particularly in, in, um, uh, growing organizations to have very high, very technical individual contributors, and disregard the fact that they perhaps don't have, you haven't helped them develop sort of um, the soft skills necessary to 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 be part of a uh, you know a, a more collaborative, cross-functional sort of organization like a platform team. Um, I, I always say to people like you know um, somebody says oh well, what, what 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 are the qualities you look for in a staff engineer? And I'm like well they need to be really technical, but they also need to be um, interested in collaboration, uh, interested in like they want to solve organization-wide problems. That may not necessarily be technical ones. They may be process problems. They may be um, hiccups in in knowledge, or um, that their their job is is, is um, I don't like the militaristic phrases, but force multiplier um, for for an organisation. I think my mistake has been assuming that just because someone is technical uh, means they're the perfect fit to lead a uh, you know or work in a in a platform team. Um, they need to have that more holistic viewpoint. Yeah, I remember. Um uh, an analogy I heard earlier, which is that, you know, platform team or staff engineers, sorry, have like different personas. And there's like commanders, leaders. And one I remember was wizard, which is like uh, the super technical person, but also can be spiky or pointy in yeah, that, yeah. you know, they're they can solve some of your deepest, hardest technical problems, but they 
maybe some things don't work super well with others or have, you know, kind of good communication skills. Yeah. And I think when I first started out in the industry, those people were, um, they were definitely like, I, I worked in banking finance and there were folks who worked on the encryption side of things. Um, like I, I'm a, a gifted amateur in that space um, based on having been a security person. But those folks are like deep in the um, compliance policy, uh, deep in the technology, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, have read every single paper that, uh, on an encryption topic and can can you know do the math in in that paper or you know in their head sort of stuff. Um, uh, and you know there, there was definitely a, a role for those sort of sort of very technical people who pe- perhaps are a little bit spiky or perhaps not so interested in 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 being part of a broader sort of more collaborative thing. I think those roles are increasingly uh, that I think those those people have to change. Like the, the opportunity for those people to be isolated like that, particularly in small organizations is vanishingly a small. Like you have to have some of those skills um, just because it's not, um, you know, there are a handful of organizations where you can afford to have, um, you know, uh, people in those particular roles. Like a, the olden days, you maybe used to be a fellow or something like that at someone like IBM or HP um, and uh, I think, um, uh, Microsoft Microsoft has a similar has a similar function. Um, like th- there's a bunch of people who work for for Satya directly who have a similar sort of function. All of those people, very very slick operators, like actual people who are able to communicate, collaborate, because they are effectively the CEO's technology advisors. They're the CEO's arm of like, um, the the then generally not people who are, you know, there might be some bookish academic people who who are on the side there. Microsoft Research is a whole bunch of those folks. But if they can't actually turn that thing they're doing into something that someone can actually use, I feel like the value is is, is a little bit diminished at least. Agreed, definitely. Um, James, I'd love to ask you know. So you have been you know an advisor for a bunch of companies. You've been kind of on the team as engineering leader, and you have had kind of a fresh eyes experience at a bunch of different engineering organizations. How do you think about the areas to focus on when you come into a new team? Um. I, 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 some of this, I think, is 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 just wisdom acquired by experience. Like I was, some of, some on the side of my new job, one of the engineers was like, "Oh my, these things are broken. Like th- these things are on fire." And I'm like, "Okay, take a step back. I can assure you, I have not seen anything since I started that that is a surprise to me. Like I've not seen anything like, oh my god, this is a this is a new and awful thing. Um, like every organization that goes through that hyperscale phase, almost certainly to, depends on. You know, the problems vary a little bit and the, the focus is very little bit, but they all suffer the same broad problems. Um, so I, I really look at, um, at, you know, I have a, a sort of mind map of, of the things I care about more broadly, but, um, and I sort of touch on a few of those, but I really, I focus primarily on who's on the team and what are they doing? Um, uh, what, are our, what are our objectives? Like what, what, what is the business trying to achieve? Uh, how do we, how are we currently trying to deliver to those objectives? Like, how does the process work? How, how does product get get built? Um, and then lastly, I think about where we need to be. Like, what, what, no, what, in what sort of short, medium, long term time frame? Like, we know that these are the objectives of the organization going forward. Like, what areas are looking like they're a little bit unstable or on fire that I need to focus on? Um, and you can't get everything. Like uh, today, I was just working through some SOC two stuff with people, and. Um, you know, I would definitely love to be to be able to say SOC two is going to be something that that is sort of uh, is always going to be a focus, but it but it's not. I, you know, th- there are definitely other things that I, I want to worry about. Um, uh, but I, I I sort of took a dive in. I looked around. I thought, okay, in its current form, it's not awesome, but it's not terrible either. Like we're on track to do what we need to do. Um, like this is a level of investment should make. But I looked over another part of the business um, yesterday and was like we have underinvested here. Like it's definitely not a great part. Of, and, and we definitely need to think about how do we, how we do that. And that's going to be in uh, like a, at the expense of something else. So how do I prioritize that? Like how do I work with the business to make sure that we deliver all the things they need while still, um, uh, I guess, uplifting the areas where it's more than technical debt, where organizational debt has accumulated. Yeah. One thing that was interesting that you brought up was uh, how one engineer brought up like, well, this part's on fire and everything's broken. It's like, in their world, yes, but yeah. in your world, this is actually maybe a small problem in the, the much larger grand scheme. Yeah, of and, and there's, it's really important. Like, I, I'm never dismissive of people because it's their, their real, that's their learned experience, right? Like, they, they it, and if, if they think that's on fire and it sucks to do their job, they're, you know, why would they stay? Like, and there's, 
early stage startups, like definitely people were very passionate. It, like they're prepared to put up with an enormous amount of spiky friction um, because they love the organization they want to do there. Second and third wave employees, maybe at a Series B or a Series C, are much more about a paycheck. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I really hate this side of the the venture based community who are like everyone should be like aligned to the mission. I'm like it's just not realistic, right? Like the company is no longer your family; they're no longer your friend. Like they're people that that, that make you that, like they're people that pay your rent and your mortgage and your food and and put your kids to school, right? You may you you definitely want to care about the mission. You definitely want to be like. I think they're building something cool. I want to be involved in that. I think they're going to make me a lot of money. Like th- those are those are definitely things that you don't want to disengage an employee, but you can't take them for granted anymore. You can't say they're part of our family and they'll put up with this because some of those early employees will until they get burnt out and they and they leave prob- sometimes in a catastrophic explosion. Um, but the other ones, you want to make sure that they're having a good experience. And so for me, if the person said that's on fire, I'm like, okay, it's not, a, it's not that bad, but let's step through what's going on here. Like, okay, let's work out what we can do iteratively to make this better. And like I, I last night I, I, I spent some time with an engineer um, just talking through like, it was like, this is always broken. I'm like, okay, well, this is what I've seen in the past. This maybe we could try. Um, and he was like, oh, that's a really good idea. And then this morning there's a PR that, 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 that like addresses some of the problem. It's not perfect, but uh, all he wanted was someone to listen to him. Like someone to have a conversation and say, okay, I acknowledge this is a problem. Here's some ideas we can fix on this. You know, help him get out of that morass. Yeah. You know, we talked about, uh, as you've seen different organizations, you know, kind of structurally, a lot of the problems they face are the same. Is there anything you've seen as something that uh, is a hallmark of what successful engineering organizations do? Like if an organization is doing this, they're probably doing something right. Um. I mean, ultimately, it, it's it's shipping product, right? If you if you're if you're um, shipping product that meets the business's needs in a time in a manner in a timely manner that 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 addresses the the KPIs, the objectives, um, then that's success to me. Like, there's there's a um, and organizations like that um, uh, who are doing that in a like the, there's definitely ways different ways to do that, and you can definitely break organizations by trying to force it into a pattern. But if if you're doing that. And the people doing doing the shipping are, are happy and and believe that that things are going well, or are, are happy like okay, there's stuff that's not great, but I'm uh, we're we're moving in the right direction and and we're iterating towards like a um, a better place. Um, to me, that those are those um, uh, that success is like you know, uh, a it, it drives a lot of you know people's. Ha- overall happiness in, in what they're doing um, there's nothing worse than being stuck like you're nothing worse than not being able to ship things or listening to the business say oh my god this is all broken why can't you fix it like um, so the flow on effect from that is enormous but that's what I look at first is like are we building things and are they getting out the door and are, are they the right things and are people happy with them um, and if those things are happening um, you know, that there may be some tuning we need to do to make sure that the people building those things are also happy um, and that the things are not awful. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I will say that it's very rare you find an organisation doing those things where the engineers aren't happy. You can't force march people. Like, the, you know, maybe for a brief point in time, the engineers are doing all of that stuff and it's shipping and it's fine, but they're all on LinkedIn thinking about the next gig, right? Because they, you've, you've made them do awful things in order to achieve that. Um, yeah, you so, burn their yeah, confidence, yeah. burn that trust. Burn them out. Like, you know, so, you know, if you see, if you see that pattern where it's, it's, it's a sustained, um, uh, you know, up and to the right sort of, sort of improvement of, of, of shipping, it's probably a pretty good sign that things are okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Nice. I have one final question for you around just kind of like organizational scaling, which is uh, a common pattern I've seen is, uh, taking you know a senior engineer and then kind of turning them into an edge manager or have them be this kind of hybrid like you'll still you know write code half the time and then also sort of be an engine manager this sort of player coach model is that something that what are your thoughts on that approach or you know is it really like you're an edge manager or you're an individual contributor but you shouldn't try to be both at the same time um I used to believe that that was a real thing that hybrid role the you know player coach thing it's not um uh, Lindsay Holmwood was also an early DevOps person. Actually, coined a, I, I think he stole it from somewhere else, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to give him credit for it. But um, he said, um, you know, becoming an engineering manager is a new job, not a promotion. Um, like you are not going from an IC to an engineering manager 
it is literally like you know uh, uh, changing your the, your role entirely. Like one of the things that, that I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about is like what's different when you're a manager, and like a, an engineer, like you, you obviously have to be uh, focused on engineering skills and technology and um, uh, you know building things and collaboration and quarter. But as an engineering manager, particularly in a small startup, all of a sudden you're um, you're a recruiter, um, you're a finance person, you're an operations person, uh, you know, you are an HR person, like you're doing all of these, th- these additional roles, you're wearing all these additional hats, and often you work in an environment that doesn't have any supporting infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, uh, I work in a relatively small startup now. Um, you know, our COO is pretty heavily involved in, in some, what would be most organizations would be considered sort of pretty low level sort of things because you know, our operations team is pretty small. Um, so my expectation of my directors is that they're pretty heavily involved in in, in uh, uh, areas that may not necessarily appear to be apparently relevant to them, like uh, RevOps and, and metrics like that. Like uh, uh, if my directors don't have a really solid understanding of how that works and what's happening, um, like I'm, I'm not, um, I don't think they're doing a great job. Um, so if you think that you can sort of go, I'm, I'm, I built technology and now I'm a manager and I don't have to develop any skills to do that, um, or it's like it's a promotion, I just have to enhance the skills I have now, you're going to fail dismally. And I think that we set people up for failure if we, if we um, put them in those hybrid roles where they, uh, they don't have enough time to develop the new skills they need. Uh, they're expected to maintain parity in the skills they have now um, and they can't, they're, they're probably very inexperienced and find it, find it really hard to assess uh, what investment they should make in what parts of their role, and they will automatically default back to the things they feel most comfortable with, which is building technology. And all of a sudden, you're like, they're a terrible manager. And you're like, yes, because you set them up to be a terrible manager. Yeah, there was no incentive for them yeah. to spend time on the management. They're actually doing two different jobs. Yep. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, well, before we wrap up, uh, James, I always like to ask, you know, what is your favorite music uh, to listen to while you work? Oh, um, that's interesting. Uh, so uh, I'm um, uh, a huge fan of, um, uh, I guess, early Australian pub rock, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, I guess a, a genre in its own right. But you know, um, uh, Paul Kelly and, and uh, sort of a, uh, I guess I, I, I when I when I was a, uh, I guess we all liked the music we liked when we were teenagers. Um, so um, uh, you know, I went to see a lot of bands in my late teens and early twenties at, at pubs, and they were little little tiny bands that that um, some of them were successful, and some of them weren't. In excess was like a, a little bit. I remember numbers. in excess. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. There's definitely some stuff that people have heard of, but I'm thinking most Americans will have no idea who I'm talking about. That um, but yeah, it's 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 small bands that are that are um that go betweens, like the things things that I things I, uh, I think it's some level of comfort in, in listening to music that you you know pretty well, and and uh, it, it it helps to sort of settle the background perhaps. Yeah, the the exports from the '90s from Australia that I remember because I grew up in Canada at the time was uh, NXS was one and Natalie Brulia. Yes, uh, they did the torn. torn. Yeah, that, that, I think that I don't know I don't know what happened with that song, but I've never met someone from the English speaking world, like English, Canadian, South African, New Zealanders who who have who don't know that song. It's it's just it's weird. I I had a conversation with an Irish guy at the Edinburgh Festival a couple of years ago. And he, the only bit of Australian music he'd ever heard about was Natalie Imbruglia. And I was like... There was the other song. What was it? Um, I forgot the band, but it's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to wreck the chorus. Like, I'm from the land down under, you know? Like, oh, the, that, um, uh, it's... Um, uh, um, oh, my God. I've forgotten the names. Um, but, yeah, th- there was a... There was a um, um, uh, that was a that was I think it was a bit earlier. That's probably the seventies. That um that might have been the seventies. And they also literally self select in the song. Like here is where we're from, just so everybody knows. Um, men at work. That was a men at work. Men at work. That was it. Men at work. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah. Well, um, listen, James. Also, what is the best people for? Uh, the, pardon me. The best way for people to follow you on uh, social media. I used to say Twitter, but I really don't know that I'm. So, I, I should say that anymore. Um, uh. I think probably Twitter. Um, uh, I have a blog, um, which I don't maintain anywhere as often enough. Um, I guess if you really want to reach out to me and like me to respond, my emails in lots of places, that's probably the best way to get hold of me. Um, I do mentoring through Merits um, Mentoring Program. Um, happy to sort of chat with folks. Um, worst case scenario, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, and, and um, I don't look at it hugely often, um, but uh, I definitely, it's definitely one way to find me. I think Twitter, I, I visit like once every two weeks and mostly hold my head in my hands and go, oh my God, what has happened here? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Twitter, uh, I always, I have a similar conversation with uh, with other podcast guests where Twitter is like, it's 
kind of still here, but it may be on the way out, but maybe sometimes it's coming back. It's a little ambiguous right now. Yeah, I'm also like, there seems to be a few too many of the wrong sort of people here now. Like, there were obviously those people always there, but now they seem to be like the predominant They're voice. amplified a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, and I don't really, that's not a place that I'm happy to be, so. Um, I hear you. I hear you. Well, listen, everybody, feel free to follow James, you know, maybe on Twitter, but also his blog and his LinkedIn. And we'll include all of that information in the show description. Um, today, we talked about platform engineering, as well as techniques for running effective teams and, uh, and companies. Uh, James, it has been absolutely great having you on. And I just super appreciate the time uh, that you've given to, to you know, join us and uh, you know, uh, talk to us and talk to our listeners. Thank you to all of our listeners for making it to the end of another episode. If you have any topics or guests you'd like to see on the show, always send us an email at levelup at opslevel.com and we'll see everybody next time.